Welcome back. Welcome back. Russian President Medvedev has been in Prague this week to sign a landmark nuclear treaty with US President Barack Obama to cut nuclear weapons and, they say, to bring us a step closer to a safer world. But for most Russians, it's the threat of home which is of more greater concern following last week's terrorist attacks on Moscow's metro, which left 39 people dead. The two female suicide bombers are believed to be from Russia's troubled North Caucasus region. To discuss the latest from Russia, I'm joined by Irina Demchenko, bureau chief of the Russian news agency RIA, RIA Novosti. Welcome. What, Hello. what has things, have things settled down after that, that shocking bombing on the subway? Uh, one of the stations which was attacked is five minutes walk from our headquarter where our news agency is located and it was in the rush hour so many of my colleagues were on this exactly train luckily not in this exactly coach and some of them arrived on the train from the opposite direction in, in, in this time so they were all witnesses and we were very very much scared about their lives one of them lost his younger brother in these attacks. Uh, and, and, they, and they seem to have pointed out, out that it was very young assassins who were responsible for these killings. Yes. 17, 18, 19, that sort of thing. Yes, exactly. One of them was a school teacher uh, in the North Caucasus, as, as you mentioned. The other one was uh, just 17 years old. Is this a growing trend in Russia? I mean, is this catching like an epidemic, these sort of killings? I wouldn't say so, because we didn't have these sort of things for nearly five years in Russia. Uh, I, I would say it's probably the threat which is spreading around the world, which equally uh, actually threatens to the, to the people around the world, rather than in one particular country. And what do the, the people in, in Russia think of the attitude and action of their leaders? I mean, do they think they've handled this situation well or not? Uh, you see, when these sort of things happen, uh, wha wha one actually thing uh, which people are starting to think about is that we are not all protected. And, and the governments are, are, are thinking of the same, because it's so difficult to protect people in, in this environment, in this situation. Uh, obviously, after the attacks happened, the, the, the government reacts and, and all the services was absolutely brilliant. But, but this, feelings of, this feeling of unprotected, being unprotected on, on the transports or, or in, the in the public places, uh, this is actually terrible. And in, in a situation like this, uh, an emergency like this, who's the person who, who guides what what should happen, Mr. Medvedev or Mr. Putin? I would say both Putin and Medvedev, uh, in, in their particular duties, uh, uh, did their responsibilities. So, so. And what about the other thing that's happened this week as well? I mean, in this whole situation with regard to disarmament, there seems to have been a, a, clear, a clear move forward towards disarmament in the mm. past week which could be good news for the world. I mean, is it good news for the world? Obviously, of course. Yeah, it must of be. Of course. I think the two, uh, three actually sides are gaining from this, from this treaty. It is obviously Russia, United States, and, and the world. Mm. Well, that, that includes most of us there somewhere, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, that's a bit of good news there and so on. And, and it's a pleasure to have you with us, and uh, we always enjoy welcoming you here. And here's to the next time. This week, the Prime Minister announced, to nobody's particular surprise, that a general election will be held here in Britain on May the 6th. It will come as no surprise to all of you, and it's probably the least well-kept secret of recent years. But the Queen has kindly agreed to the dissolution of Parliament, and a general election will take place on May the 6th. There will be many big challenges and many big decisions to make over the next few months, 
upon which our future success depends. Get the big decisions right, as we did in the last 18 months facing world recession, and jobs, prosperity, and better standards of living will result. Here on Al Jazeera English, we'll be covering every aspect of the campaign over the next few weeks, starting today with the most obvious question, does it really make much difference? I'm delighted to be joined by one of Britain's best-known politicians, who won't, alas, be standing in these elections, Anne Widdicombe. Welcome to... Uh, Thank you. Welcome to Divine Anne. And by the leading pollster of the moment, the founder of Morrie, Sir Robert Worcester. Bob, welcome David. to have you both. Now, let's start right there with these two great minds focusing on this situation. In the headlines, we're reading all the papers saying it's going to be a hung parliament. What do you think, Anne? Is it going I, to be a hung parliament? I think there will not be a hung parliament. Uh, I think it is entirely conceivable that you may have um, a governing party with a clear majority, but nevertheless a small majority. Uh, I think that is perfectly possible. I don't think we're actually going to see a hung parliament. I don't want to see a hung parliament. Uh, I think people should not be seduced by any supposed attractions of a hung parliament, because if you do have one, it isn't you, the people, who have chosen the government. It's the politicians themselves who do deals in smoke-free rooms on the backs of envelopes as to how they will coalesce with each other. What do you think about that, Bob? Do you think that this is an invasion of your primacy, the idea of this <laughs> situation? No, developing? indeed. Uh, I do not, because uh, polls are only accurate at the time they are taken, and then within statistical limits. So all the polls have been very consistent over the last three months, amazingly consistent, with the Tories stable at 38 plus or minus. There have been over 60 polls. The polls are accurate with an unknown degree of probability, a plus or minus 3 percent. But if you look at the share for the Conservative Party, every one of those 60 plus polls have had them at 38 plus or minus 3. Now, if they stay there, then it's possible that there will indeed be a hung parliament, but with sufficient margin over Labour that Labour cannot cobble together a coalition, and David Cameron, the leader of the Conservative Party, will become Prime Minister. Because he can do that? He can do that. Uh, the, the, the rules state that the Prime Minister carries on until he or she cannot form a government. But usually in this country there is a, uh, a convention that if they can see that there's no chance of it, they'll go fairly quickly. And I suspect by Monday morning, after the 6th of May election, that David Cameron will be at 10 Downing Street as Prime Minister of this country. And you believe that? You believe that the, the momentum of opinion in those last days leading up to that decisive vote are going to take him over the hill. On balance, the public uh, is has mixed feelings about whether a hung parliament would be a good thing or a bad thing. However, I believe that the people who really count in those last 24 hours, the 10 percent or so who make up their mind during that last day. During that last day? Yes. We have every election going back to the 1970s we have measured immediately post-election when did you make up your mind on how to vote and 10 percent to or maybe maybe the bracket of 8 percent to 12 percent say they made up their mind on the very last day uh, and there's the tactical voting going on and there's the decision whether or not to vote that's in that algebraic uh, equation uh, but there's a factor at play this time that we haven't had before. We've got the televised debates. Uh, and I think that particularly that first televised debate, which is something new, it's something historic, I think millions are going to be watching it, they'll certainly dip in and out of it. Uh, and I think that whoever wins that first debate that early in the campaign 
um, is going to be on a tremendous roll. So I think things are slightly different this time. I mean, I agree with Bob. Uh, people do make up their minds at the last minute. They tell us that. You know, you knock on doors. They sure. tell us that. We know that. But I think this time round we've got an unusual factor at play, and I think those debates are going, and particularly the first one, are going to be hugely influential. Hugely. Hugely influential. And the first one, or all of them? I think the first one particularly, because that's where people will form their opinions. And then unless there's something very dramatic in either of the other two, uh, I, I think people probably won't move very far from those opinions. Not move very far from those opinions. Do you agree with that, Bob? I would only like to dispute one thing in what Anne said, and that's that I believe that first debate is not for winning, it's for losing. And whoever <laughs> loses that first debate, they've lost the election. Now, it's going to be difficult for David Cameron because he's expected to be a brilliant speaker. It's going to be wonderful for Nick Clegg, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, because he's getting exposure who is relatively unknown. And it's for Brown not to blow it because nobody expects him to do well, but they expect David Cameron to do well, and if he should blow it, that's going to be a big problem. And you can remember, at least Ann and I can certainly remember, when he was not expected to be leader of the Conservative Party four years ago. But the leading candidate, a man named David Davis, was expected to be, and he gave a terrible speech on the Monday of the Tory party conference, and on the Wednesday, David Cameron gave a brilliant speech, and he was elected leader later in that week. Anne. I think the, there is a, a, a tremendous power uh, to the oratory, mm. to whoever performs extremely well in this. Where I do disagree with Bob is, I don't think, I mean, we may be going in with those sorts of impressions, while well, Gordon isn't expected to do terribly well, etc. I don't think the population is going in with those impressions. I think the population, we're going into this with a very, very eager curiosity. And if Gordon performs badly, they won't say, well, that's all we expected. They will say, it's no good, it's over. Right. Yeah. And in terms, of, in terms of that reaction, I mean, that means that he can't necessarily win, even if he does disappointingly well, he will be overcome with the, the strength of the reaction to his I, negative performance. I think that first debate is going to decide things. Going to, going to be decide everything. That first debate. You can never say decide everything, but I think it will be very, very hard to reverse whatever comes out of that first debate. And I have to say I'm very sorry for all three leaders because everything's riding on it. And right, right now, one of those or all of those three leaders are about to walk through that door, Bob. What is the vital piece of advice you'd give them? Play it very cool, very courteous. This is not a party election broadcast for hammering away. This is not going to be a prime minister's question time in a bear pit. They will have a massive audience in that first debate. After four and a half hours, I'm not sure that is going to be sustained. And that's why we both think that the first debate is key. But it is three weeks before polling day. It's the 15th, next Thursday. Now, that means there's time between the first debate and the end of the election period that other things can happen. And as Harold McMillan said, it could be events, dear boy, events. Events, dear boys, events. We'll see what happens. That's a tremendous preview you've given us there for this situation that's coming up over the next few weeks. You'll all be watching out there for what's happening. My thanks to all our guests today. Join me again in seven days time, of course. But in the meantime, Keep thinking about these great thoughts that we've been given by Anne and Bob. And thank you for joining us. All the best for now. Bye-bye.